Hey, everybody. Welcome to Your Money Map, sponsored by the Alliance for Lifetime Income. I'm your host, Jean Chatsky. Thanks so much for joining me today for what I'm sure is going to be a really fun conversation that I, I hope you'll participate in, whether you are watching us on Facebook or LinkedIn. Take a moment, pop into the comments, tell us who you are, tell us where you are, say hello, and let's dive into our discussion of love and money. When it comes to decisions about love or relationships, the advice is usually to go with your gut or listen to your heart. But what about when those decisions concern love and money. My guests today are experts in making those decisions. Myra Strober is a labor economist who became the first ever woman to teach at Stanford University's Graduate School of Business. She led a popular course on love and money, and that is where she crossed paths with Abby Davison, who at the time was a student taking the class with her then boyfriend, now husband. Years later, Myra and Abby teamed up to to write a book. It's called Money and Love, An Intelligent Roadmap for Life's Biggest Decisions. And the book provides a framework for all of us to look at the big choices that we will face throughout a lifetime of relationships, everything from deciding who to marry to picking a place to retire with your partner. Today, they are both joining us to share their insights into how we can better navigate money matters with our partners at every stage of life. Myra and Abby, welcome. Thank you so much for joining me here today. It's our pleasure. Yeah, well, thank, thank you. Thank you. Thank you for being here. So Myra, let me start with you because you started out on this journey. Tell me a little bit about the class that launched um, both your relationship with Abby and this book. When I first started teaching the class, I actually started teaching it when I was at Berkeley and the course was called uh, Women and Work. And it was 1970 and very few women were in the labor force and also mothers of young children. And so these women that I was teaching really had no role models. Uh, their mothers, their aunts had not worked when they were young, when, when the children were young. And um, so we started talking about how to combine work and family. And then when I moved to Stanford, I took the course with me and um, eventually some intrepid men took the class women in work. And one of them said, you know, this class is really relevant for men. If you would change the title of the class to work and family, I will personally recruit guys for next year. And so <laughs> I changed the name and he recruited. And when I stopped teaching the course uh, years later, 40% of the students in the class were men. And the conversations were so much better. I have to imagine that it became one of the most popular courses at Stanford. I I um, I didn't go there for for college or for graduate school, but had I gone there, I definitely definitely would have signed up uh, for this class as you did, Abby, with your then boyfriend. What was it that appealed to you? Well, we had met in business school and. It, but things were getting serious and we um, each, you know, it was much later than, than 1970, but neither of us had role models either for um, in our own families for how to combine a career. We were both very ambitious about our careers and a personal life and priorities outside of our career. Both of us had mothers who had paused work or left the workforce where they had children and I didn't want to do that. Um, he didn't want me to do that, but we didn't really have a guide for how to do that. And so we signed up for the course and very early in the course, this was our second year of business school. We were about to graduate. We needed to make big decisions about whether we should accept a job in the same city or whether we should live together if we ended up in the same city. And Myra being a labor economist always shared very interesting data points. And one of those data points she shared was that couples who live together before getting married have higher divorce rates. And that was very surprising to us, not what we would have expected. And so for our final paper, we dug into that 
trying to understand why that was the case, if anything could be done to prevent it, and um, wrote the paper. It then became the blueprint for now um, almost 15 years of marriage. And after the course, we stayed in touch with Myra. It really changed our lives, and she invited us to be guest speakers for almost a decade. So we got to um, go back to the place where it started, talk to students as we were putting everything into practice, climbing the career ladder, having young children, and trying to make it all work. Abby, I assume based on your research and Myra's um, take on the situation, you did not live with your husband before you got married. We actually did, but it was because we uncovered in our research the, the fact that there is something you can do to mitigate all those negative effects of living together before marriage, which is be intentional. So it turns out that if you go into the arrangement, having had conversations about how you're going to combine your lives, including your finances, your careers, even which holidays you're going to spend with your respective families, those negative outcomes go away. So the the final paper we wrote in the class actually really did become our guide for how we would do that. And um, fortunately, the research paid off, and uh, we didn't. We knock on wood have not had um, the negative outcomes and the issues that uh, that go into those statistics. I'm, I'm knocking on wood for you right here. Um, <laughs> <Thanks>. <laughs> Um, we're hitting Valentine's Day next week. Um, it is the time of year when news organizations and financial institutions around the country, around the world, release their latest studies on financial infidelity, which is their way of telling us that, you know, decisions about love for the most part uh, are, are fairly easy. But once you add money to the mix, it gets really complicated. Myra, why is that? Well, how to combine assets or how to combine them, if you start with none, how to combine them as you go along is a very a difficult problem. And um, most people or many people think that talking about money is just unromantic. And so here they are in a romantic relationship and money is the one topic they don't talk about. And we think that's a big mistake. Uh, we think, and the book calls them uncomfortable conversations. We think people should have uncomfortable conversations before they're ready for the conversations. <laughs> so that means once the two of you are serious about being together, talk about money. Talk about your philosophy of money. I mean, if you're young, you may not have quite a philosophy of money, but you know whether you like to spend most of your money or save some portion of it, you know what your financial goals are, or you can certainly think about that. And uh, if two people come to be on the same page about money, um, and then we can talk separately about uh, how we think both members of the couple should keep track of the money coming in and the money going out, um, then the opportunities and the problems for problems um, are um, mitigated, reduced. Uh, how, how you said talk about these things before you're ready to talk about them. How soon, Abby, do you tee these things up? I mean, I've I've always rolled my eyes a bit. I have to admit. Um, uh, uh, at those at those articles that suggest that you talk about your credit score on the on the first or second date, like I am, first of all, I'm married, but second of all, I am not doing that. Yeah, I mean, I have to say, I don't think the first or second date is where I would personally initiate that conversation either. Um, but one thing that I think does work well is tying it to a specific experience, and for couples starting out um, earlier in the relationship that's often going on a trip together. And that could be a really good um, prompt to bring up the budget for the trip, right? There is a range of places you could choose to stay. There are um, in, in every price point, right? And so you can use the budget for your trip as an entry point to say, hey, we're going away together. I realize we haven't really talked much about money. Um, one thing you should know about me is that I feel really strongly about paying off my school loans every month. And that's about 
you know, X dollars. And that means I'd be more comfortable keeping our budget to Y. And if you go first and you sort of model the type of vulnerability and transparency that you want your potential long-term partner to also display, that creates that moment for them to say, you could say, you know, is there anything I should know about your budget, right? And that, that creates that entry point that's less awkward than if you just, you know, pull out your budgeting app on the first date and say, you know, show me, I'll show you mine if you show me yours. Like that's, you know, awkward. <laughs> A little, a little bit. And you, I think that, that going first is really key. I mean, reporters, and I grew up as a reporter, we do this all the time, right? We give a little to get a little. I tell you a little bit about me. You tell me a little bit about you. You tell me more about you. And all of a sudden I have, I have a story to write. It, the decisions though, that, that romantic partners make when they're young look a lot different um, than those that they'll make as they get older. When you are um, a little older, a little more established, or, or a lot older, a lot more established, what changes in the, in the way that you need to handle your relationship, Myra? Well, the first thing is that if you do um, begin conversations about money very early on, and if you continue to have them throughout, through some sort of uh, annual retreat or whatever your mechanism is as a couple to keep in touch on really important things. And, you know, once you have children, the opportunities to keep in touch keep diminishing <laughs> with the number of children you have. So you have to plan some time to get together, uh, hopefully without the children, to discuss these issues. And money is one of them. So as time goes on, uh, the issues get more complicated. What sort of house should you buy? In what neighborhood? Um, how are you going to plan for your children's college education if you have children? Um, and then, you know, the toughest decision of all is when are you going to retire and how are you going to afford retirement? And, um, you know, Bill Sharp, who has won the Nobel Prize in uh, economics, says that the nastiest problem he's ever encountered is how to manage your money during retirement uh, to make sure that it lasts. And so these problems are ongoing. And uh, Abby likes to talk about developing a money muscle. And I think that's a wonderful uh, metaphor. You know, you, you develop a joint money muscle so that you can <laughs> exercise it and talk about it with ease as you go through life. What is that, Abby? How do you do that? Well, it's, you know, just with any muscle. Um, so the, that's the analogy, right? That that these conversations are really hard at the beginning. And, you know, it, it was not easy at all for my then boyfriend and I to talk about, for example, you know, what percentage of our salaries we would contribute to our rent, right? We were graduating from business school. I was going to work for a nonprofit and he was going to work for a hedge fund. We were earning wildly different salaries. And so, you know, we had to talk about things like, is it fair for us to contribute the exact same dollar amount towards our rent or should it be a percentage of our income? How would we decide the percentage? But prompted by Myra's class and with the research that, you know, the problems come when you slide into an arrangement versus decide deliberately. So we were trying to avoid that sliding and we had to have these very real uncomfortable conversations, but you know what? Um, it did get easier over time. And just like a muscle, you start with the low weight, you do some reps, you then, you know, get sore the next day, you come back, eventually you're lifting heavier and heavier weights and not getting sore because you've developed that practice. And so now, you know, we both in the last couple of years just made very big job changes from the corporate world where we were earning, you know, very good salaries to now both being entrepreneurs. And we made that difficult decision by having these conversations, by reviewing our finances um, regularly, as Myra mentioned. And it's a muscle we've been building over the last, you know, now um, 17 years since we took the class. And it's enabled us to have the conversations, not with ease, I wouldn't use that word, but with less discomfort and more um, trust than 
we certainly did at the very beginning. I, I think that is such an important point. I, I do this for a living, right? I talk about money for a living and yet sometimes the conversations I have with my husband are uncomfortable too. And we have them anyway, because we need to have them. But I don't, I don't like prescribing this in a way that sounds to people as if it should be easy or a breeze, because it's not always easy or a breeze. It's, you got to do it anyway, right? It's, it's, it's your flu shot or your vitamins or whatever you want to call it. But but it, it, it does get easier over time. I, I want to come back to the question that you raised, Abby, about that split, because we get that question a lot. And I'm wondering, in your research, is there a way of merging money or not merging money that has been shown to be more successful for more couples? So we did primary research by talking to couples that had different arrangements with their finances and then also looked at um, documented research studies that had been done. And the studies and the experts seem to agree that having at least some joint accounts, at least one place where you're both contributing dollars into a bank account and using that to pay for shared expenses is best practice. But then there was an agreement on how much should that be you know, nearly everything? Should that be just a portion, you know, the bare minimum for those expenses? So what we did was in talking to, you know, the different people, try to understand, you know, what was the rationale behind their decision? What was some of the issues that they ran into? Um, my husband, for example, his parents merged everything. And he remembers his mother having to um, hide credit card statements when she had bought her husband a gift right? When he, she bought his dad a gift, like it couldn't be a surprise if she had paid for it with their joint account. So we had decided, okay, we'll maintain some separate money just for each of us to be able to do things like buy each other gifts, like go on trips with our friends that we're not going to benefit the other person. But um, we actually started out um, merging the bare minimum of our salaries. And then over time with each additional milestone we hit, when we got engaged, we increased the salary we contributed or the percentage of our salary we contributed to the joint account. When we got married, we increased it again. When we had kids and started to pay childcare expenses. We increased it again. So at this point, you know, now 15 years, two kids later, the vast majority of our income um, is joined. We still have some separate accounts from retirement from the money we had before kids. Um, but we've reached a point where we've merged everything that we're going to merge, um, but still maintained enough that we feel we have our quote unquote own money for things where we don't need to run by the other person. Myra, do you ever worry about women who merge everything and then stop paying attention? Exactly. I was just going to say, that one advantage of having some money separate is so that women uh, learn to pay attention to at least some part of their assets. Uh, because I know too many couples um, who either get divorced or are widowed and the woman doesn't know anything about finances. And I think that's changing over time. I think younger women do know more about finances. But if you are managing some percentage of your assets in your own account, that doesn't assure that you will pay attention, but it's certainly more likely that you will. Yeah, absolutely. And by the way, it's dangerous whether you're a man or a woman. It's not gender specific. Um, yes. to, it's just dangerous to take your eye completely off the ball and, and not know what happens because in the event that something happens to your partner, you really uh, could be in a very tough situation. I, I know um, because I know the people who watch this show, um, they like tactics and they like framework. And you have 
developed a framework, um, you outline it in, in your book, um, for how couples should go about making financial decisions. You, you call these the five C's, and I was hoping that you could take us through them. Um, Abby, you want to start? Sure. And I'll just say before I dive in that one of the reasons we developed a framework was because everyone's situation is um, a bit different and um, you're going to have to make decisions over and over again. So we wanted to develop something that was flexible, meaning it could be applied to a wide variety of decisions about money and love, but also sturdy, meaning you could rely on the same framework over and over again. And so that was the, the reason behind it. It was actually not part of the class when Myra taught it, but we developed it together um, as part of our research um, for the book. So the first C of the five Cs is clarify, as in clarify what's most important to you. And um, that is very important when two people are involved in the decision that you first clarify your individual perspective. What is important to you? Try to tune out all the other voices. It's very hard because we all, in some level, hear the voices of our parents or our teachers or important people in our lives. Um, and we're very influenced by other people's wants. That's mimetic desire is the term um, for that. But by clarifying what we want, by trying to tune those voices out, we get a clearer picture on what's most important to us. And then we can do the second C, which is to communicate. So this is what Myra was talking about and having those conversations early. Once you've clarified what's important to you, you have a conversation with anyone else who's going to be affected by the decision. And that communicate is about both talking, expressing your perspective, but also listening and being willing to be influenced by the other person, which is not always what we do in conversations. Right. If, if you have clarified what you want, I mean, people come to marriage and, and to relationships sometimes with this weird perception that just because they're in love, they are all of a sudden the same person. And in reality, that's that's not always the case, right? I mean, or rarely the case. You're attracted to something that you don't see in yourself quite often in this other person, which means what's important to you as you clarify maybe maybe something very different than than what's important to your partner. So Myra, as you come to the communication step, how do you negotiate your way to a shared goal? Well, first, let me say that we think about clarifying and communicating as a bit of a dance. So it's not like you clarify and then you tell your partner what you're thinking and your partner tells you, and then everybody goes to sleep. No, because <laughs> what your partner tells you, if you're listening, um, may change your view of what you want, because now you've heard something maybe you haven't heard before. And so you go away and you re-clarify, and then you come back and dance together. And then this may go on for a while, hopefully not forever, but you know, <laughs> a, few, a few weeks, a few months perhaps. Okay, so then, how do you help as a couple uh, to make your decision? Well, the first thing is to broaden your choices. So the third C is choices. Um, sometimes we think in binary terms, either I'm going to buy this new house or I'm going to stay in my current house. Well, maybe there are some other possibilities. Maybe you can try a new house in a new community for a few months um, and see how you like that new community. So it's not just shall I stay or shall I leave, but how shall I leave? Okay, so broaden your choices. And then um, you wanna check in with others. Uh, not, not forever and not with everybody. <laughs> um, you pick a few people, you know, let's say you're thinking about getting married um, and uh, you know some people whose marriage you think is really good and you're close to them and you ask them, well, one member of the couple, how did you decide who to marry? What was your process? Um, and so that might help you in your process. So check-in is the uh, next one. And then um, look at the consequences of your decision. This is really important. And you wanna look not only at the short-term consequences, which tend to be easy, 
but how about the long-term consequences? So you're thinking of moving and your children are very opposed. They don't want to leave their friends. Okay, so one short-term consequence is going to be that they are going to be unhappy for a while. But maybe the long-term consequence is that they're going to be going to a better school. And so that has to be taken into account. And so, you know, none of this framework ensures that you're going to uh, make the right decision because, um, you know, there's a saying, man plans and God laughs. And right. you don't know what's going to happen. Uh, something may happen that makes your decision not the right decision. But the point of going through this framework is to know in your heart that you have done everything possible to make the right decision, that you have really uh, spent time and effort on this decision and uh, you have confidence, you go ahead and hopefully um, life validates it. One of the... Um... Uh, one of the steps that you mentioned, step four, where you check in with others, makes me a little bit wary. Um, I mean, we we live so much of our lives in an echo chamber these days, right? When we're on social media, when when we've got lots of opinions coming at us at at all the time. How how do you make sure that you're actually doing this in a way where you get a, a critical but helpful viewpoint? So it really depends on the type of decision. And you're so right, Jean. Often the people whose advice we don't want are the quickest to offer it, right? And so it's very important that you um, think, first of all, about who would be genuinely helpful. And we're not, when we talk about the check-in step, it's not only your closest circle that can be most helpful. Um, one of the things that we say it's helpful to check in with is published studies and research, right? It's, it's is there data out there that might actually help me um, with this decision? Has this happened to other people that I could look at on a bigger picture scale and be and learn from that example? But when it does come to people, as Myra mentioned, it's important that you think about people whose example you admire. So, um, I'll, and, and again, it the, the, how wide you cast the net depends on the type of decision. So if the decision is about, for example, having a child or having another child, um, that is a very personal decision. Uh, and it's one that you might want to limit very intentionally who you talk about that with. But if you are um, getting older, you're a, say you're a woman, you haven't find the, found the right partner, you're thinking of being, um, going through this process of having a child on your own, who who might have, have gone through that uh, that you can look to to understand, you know, what is this really like? And, you know, yes, I see the beautiful holiday cards that you send, but tell me about the times where your, you know, kid is throwing up at night and you have to go to work and you don't have, you know, the, the daycare option. Like, what do you do then? So getting the full picture from people who, um, have been there and um, know what it's like can be so helpful. And and sometimes that makes you go back to the first step and re-clarify what's important to you, right? This is a very iterative process. It's not as if you check off the steps and one through five and then you're done. You, you do yeah. uh, feed in that information into other parts of the framework and, and allow your perspective to shift based on what you learn. You, you mentioned getting older, and um, as we look at trends in aging and longevity, one of them that we've seen particularly over the past few years is a rise in what people are calling gray divorce, um, divorce in people over 50. Actually, when you look at the people over 65 who have divorced, the numbers, I believe, have doubled um, in, in the last few years. Why, why do you think that is, Myra? Well, I think part of the answer is the exact um, uh, point that you mentioned, that uh, we are living longer. And so, you know, if you expect, you know, in 1935, life expectancy for men was 65. And so it's interesting that uh, Social Security began at 65, um, when only half of the male population would be likely to live over 65. But if you, if you're 65 and you think you're probably going to live uh, until 70 or so, then, you know, you might feel 
oh, I can put up with this for another little while. Um, if you think you're going to live to 90, then the calculation is very different. And I think a lot of the divorce stems from that. You know, I, I just don't want to keep doing this. And so I need to, um, I need to move on. Um, I think also uh, the generation that is over 65 now, it's partly my generation, um, did not have these conversations when they were younger about money, about love, about anything. Um, you know, the idea was uh, you get married and then, you know, the two of you are one in some sense. Um, and um, now people are, are missing those conversations. They have not developed a muscle to have those conversations. And it's very difficult to start doing that when you've had, you know, 40 years of uh, a different model. And so um, instead of trying, uh, people just leave and uh, try to do it all over again, hopefully better the next time. Well, well, for those people, and let me stay with you for a second, for those people who do want to do it again, it, who have gone through a divorce later in life and are thinking, you know, I have another 30 years, maybe I have 40 years, I want an extra shot at this. What advice do you have for them specifically to set themselves up for success when it comes to um, managing their finances? I mean, a lot of these people are coming to relationships with much more complicated financial lives than they had when they got married the first time. They've got kids, they've got businesses, maybe they've got inheritances coming, maybe they have they they just they've got a bigger uh, bigger life to to merge or or not to merge. So I remarried at age fifty. My uh, husband was fifty two, and so we were right in this. Uh, we weren't sixty five yet, but we each had children, and um, you know, trying to merge finances was easier than trying to merge families, and so. <laughs> We had to have conversations, not only with each other, but with our stepchildren about finances, about holidays, about um, our former spouses who are the uh, parents of these <laughs> stepchildren and how we're going to merge all of this. So in many ways, it's far more complicated than when two people get together, you know, at age 30 um, with relatively fewer assets and most likely no stepchildren, although that's possible too. So um, it, you have to, well, what does I say? You have to read our book. You have to make believe that you're starting out because you are starting out, not quite from scratch, but you're very early in the relationship. And if you want this relationship to be better, you have got to clarify and communicate. Communicate, communicate, communicate. And I often say to people, it's like um, seeing that there's a high diving board at the swimming pool. And you're thinking, can I get up on that high diving board? And then you walk around the pool a few times. But that diving board is not getting any shorter. It's not going to shorten the length between the diving board and the pool. So you might as well jump in today because you're going to have to jump in at some time. And there's no time like the present, especially for having tough conversations. Yeah, yeah, agreed. And and Michelle, who is watching, um, is is pointing out, and and she works in this field. She says, as generational wealth is shifting to women, they have more money to make the choice to divorce, and she is seeing that a lot in her practice. Um, we are about to uh, to hit on uh, the last few minutes of this conversation, and so. We like to to give people a little bit of, of advice that they can walk away with. Um, uh, what if um, I asked you for three tips for people who are just starting out and three tips for people who are starting over um, in order for them to to get this get this right? Uh, and and you can whichever one of you wants to start can. Yeah, well, I can I can take the starting out, um, and 
I would say, you know, the first tip is just to uh, start the money conversations early. We've been talking about that, but I'm going to reinforce that. I mean, there is research that shows that couples that talk about money regularly are happier. So couples who talk about money weekly um, are happy, happier than couples who rarely talk about their finances. So um, that is definitely the first tip is start the conversations early and have them regularly. To enable that, I would say the second tip is to schedule time on the calendar. It sounds, you know, silly sometimes if there's somebody who you're even living with or married with to put time on the calendar. But, you know, just as you do for a doctor's appointment or a business meeting, you need to make sure that you're blocking the time, that you're um, finding the, um, you're prioritizing it. And, you know, I mentioned, you know, my husband and I merged the majority of our money and we have regular times that we come together and we look at our assets. We talk about what to do with them. There isn't one of us that is, you know, in the dark um, because we, we make the time to do that. So I would say that's the second thing, you know, and the third tip is to approach these conversations with curiosity. Sometimes when we find out that someone um, that we are thinking of joining our life to is has a very different money approach than we do um we think oh wow well that can't work you know i'm a spender they're a saver like this isn't going to work you know that's not necessarily the case as long as you don't see your perspective as the only right one and if you go in with you know i'm curious like what's underneath that what were the early money stories that shaped you you know what are your motivations for um, saving, you know, what's behind that, you can really um, find some very interesting middle ground and find lots of places where you can join your life with someone who has a different perspective, as long as you're both committed to making it work and finding the solution. Um, and that takes that mindset of curiosity to do that. I love it. Myra, how about you for people starting over? I would over? say the first, the first step in having um, a good second marriage uh, is if the second marriage results because one or both of you has been divorced, try to have the most amicable divorce you can have. And maybe it's too late for you. Maybe the divorce has already happened and it's been terribly messy, uh, but maybe you can make it less messy um, because the issue is that that former spouse uh, is the mother or father of your children. And if that remains messy, then you're setting up a problem in the new marriage with uh, the other person's stepchildren. And uh, stepchildren can make a lot of trouble. And you want them on your side. And so you should try to include them in the money conversations. A lot of the animus that stepchildren have is the fear that their parent is going to leave all their money to the new spouse and they're not going to get anything when they die. So um, not when they die, when their parent dies. And yeah. you know, if you can alleviate that fear, if you can be honest with them and tell them what you're doing, uh, that really helps a lot. Um, and when you clarify for yourself what you want in the new marriage, I would suggest that you prioritize your relation, not, not as number one, but as a high priority, your relationship with your stepchildren, because stepchildren can really um, gum up the works in a, a second marriage. And that's also true, you know, if, if, if their parent has died. Um, so, I would say try to have an amicable divorce and try your very best to get along with your stepchildren. Fantastic. Thank you guys so much for this wonderful pre-Valentine's Day conversation. Um, I know that there are people who are watching who are looking for more information from both of you. Abby, where would you send them? So our book website is uh, has a a lot of resources and more ways to stay connected. It's moneylovebook.com. So that's a great place to take a fun quiz to understand your money and love decision making style or sign up for more information. I also have a newsletter that I write on Substack. I'm at Abby Davison. It's called Practically Deliberate. 
Fantastic. Thank you both for being here today. For anybody who's watching who'd like more information about this conversation in particular, you can go to our website, uh, which is protectedincome.org. Um, and there is a link at protectedincome.org slash Davison dash Strober for more on this conversation. Thank you guys. Thanks everybody for watching. Happy Valentine's Day. Bye. Thanks so much. Bye. Bye.